We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank all of you for joining us this early Monday morning. Well, early for me, uh, for the Quarantine Collective. We're starting a little bit earlier this week, and I think we're going to continue this time frame out. Uh, as always, uh, thank you for joining. We are always looking for volunteers and all sorts of fun people to uh, take part in what we're doing. Uh, we are finishing out uh, Chapter 3, Section 10. And from here, we will be doing... Uh, more than likely a new type of review. I'll talk about that kind of the end of the session, uh, but mostly we're just ready to dive in. Any uh, last notes before we head into uh, the rest of this section? Anyone, feel free. It's uh, time to chat. Excellent. It's uh, always fun when we have silence. Uh, people's favorite thing on the podcast, I promise. Uh, I'll go ahead and start then. The immense accomplishment of Lenin and the Russian Revolution was to have forged a class consciousness consonant with the objective being or interest of the class, and as a consequence to have imposed on the capitalist countries a recognition of class bipolarity. But this great Leninist break did not prevent the resurrection of a state capitalism inside socialism itself any more than it prevented classical capitalism from getting round the break by continuing its veritable mole work, always affecting breaks of breaks that allowed it to integrate into its axiomatic sections of the newly recognized class, while throwing the uncontrolled revolutionary elements, no more controlled by official socialism than by capitalism itself, further into the distance, to the periphery, or into the enclaves. Thus, the only choice left was between the new terroristic and rigid axiomatic, quickly saturated of the socialist state, and the old cynical axiomatic, all the more dangerous for being flexible and never saturated, of the capitalist state. But in reality, the most direct question is not that of knowing whether an industrial society can do without a surplus, without the absorption of a surplus, without a commodity exchanging and planner state, and even without an equivalent of the bourgeoisie. It is evident, both, that the answer is no, and that in these terms the question is poorly put. Nor is it a question of knowing whether or not class consciousness, embodied in a party or a state, betrays the objective class interest to which a kind of potential spontaneity would be ascribed, suffocated by the agents claiming to represent that interest. Sartre's analysis in Critique de la Raison Dialectique appears to us profoundly correct, where he concludes that there does not exist any class spontaneity, but only group spontaneity. Whence the the necessity for distinguishing groups in fusion from the class, which remains serial, represented by party or the state? Is there a break there for anyone else? My copy is fun. No, just a uh, numbered... uh... And no. And the two do and not. Although that says ninety, it says ninety nine. It should be ninety three. I remember coming across this last night. That yeah. Ninety nine. There's ninety three. Ninety three is ninety four. Of course it is. <laughs> the two do not exist in the same scale. This is because class interest remains a function of the larger molar aggregates. It merely defines a collective pre-conscious that is necessarily represented in a distinct consciousness that, at this level, does not even present any grounds for asking whether it betrays or not, alienates or not, deforms or not. The problem is situated there, between unconscious group desires and pre-conscious class interests. It is only starting from this point, as we shall see, that one is able to pose the questions issuing indirectly therefrom, concerning the class preconscious and the representative forms of class consciousness, and the nature of these interests and the process of their realization. Frank always comes back to us with his innocent standards, claiming the right of a prior distinction between desire and interest. 
The leadership has no task more urgent, besides that of acquiring a precise understanding of the objective historical process, than to understand a. What are the progressive desires, ideas, and thoughts which are latent in people of different social strata, occupations, age groups, and sexes? And b. What are the desires, fears, thoughts, and ideas, the traditional bonds, which prevent the progressive desires, ideas, etc. from developing? The leadership has a tendency rather to reply, when I hear the word desire, I pull out my gun. I saw I saw chat getting all a uh, Twitter here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask someone to tell me why. Let's start with uh, the early parts here where they're talking about the Leninist break. Does anyone want to uh, sort of share this? Expand on it? Great. I was just saying I love this section because uh, I feel it should be necessary reading for people who lionize uh, socialist states is I mean, just that section where they say, if you try and imagine a modern industrial society doing without a surplus, without absorption of surplus, without commodity exchanging, all the rest of this, it's sort of, yeah, it's just quite, it's quite a direct and savage take takedown, I feel. I don't have anything to say right now about uh, the Lenin... uh the Leninist break that they talk about, but I want to come back to that in a few paragraphs. Sounds good. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, the most direct question is not that of knowing whether an industrial society can do without a surplus, the section you were talking about. Uh, But I I want to know what they're talking about, where they say, it is evident both that the answer is no and that these terms in question is poorly put. Uh... I don't understand what question they're referring to or where like there. It feels like they're referring to a larger conversation that has happened that I wasn't privy to. To me, I kind of read that like the, the dreams of like a utopian socialist state in a way, because they're, they're talking about the, the how Leninist, the Leninist break and the Russian Revolution <laughs> did impose a new class bipolarity on on Russian, on like the the capitalist world system, but, but not without have this like subterfuge or Trojan horse of capital, you know, burying itself within it anyway. And uh, then that I read that as saying, you know, that there's as if there's some way that you can sort of do away. In fact, it's almost the the between two fifty five and two fifty six. They kind of say it uh, where they say a supposedly socialist state implies a transformation of production. Uh, but this transformation can only take place starting from an already conquered state that finds itself confronted by the same axiomatic problems of extraction of a surplus or surplus value, you know, uh, market and monetary reckoning. So I, I was reading that as them trying to essentially say that this, the question of can us you know, industrial society somehow do away with all these capitalist characteristics that are like the very basis of how it came into existence just by sort of moving around certain things in the way it's planned is kind of a fallacy. But then, and then in addition to that, well, not only is it not possible, but then the question is formed wrong because there's, I guess for them, there's uh, something deeper going on with classes, which I can't profess to understand, which is this is where they go into the SART thing. I had a question in chat about groups and fusion. I'm, I'm actually with better. you on that. What, what does that mean? What is, what is, I'm not as familiar with SART at all. Uh, not familiar with Sartan anyway. Anyone? Is anyone here familiar with Sartan? I think I have a bit of purchase on like what the word serial means for Sartre, but I'm going to try to find a definition, a definition really quick. I'm curious about the last, uh, the end of the sentence right before this um, about, uh, so nor is it a question of knowing whether or not class consciousness embodied in a part of your state betrays the objective class interest. And then here's where I'm uh, curious if everyone has insight to which a kind of potential spontaneity would be ascribed, suffocated by the agents claiming to represent that interest. What's the role of the spontaneity here? Uh, I think they're criticizing. Um, well, can I have you point to the sentence again so that I can make sure I'm uh, understanding? Uh, yeah, it's at the uh, bottom of 256 right before um, starts analysis. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, I think that the criticism is that, like, they're critiquing the idea that, like, 
so you have a socialist state, right? And the party starts claiming to represent the interests of the, of the, um, people, right? Uh, they're criticizing the sort of criticism of this party, right? As they would say, well, a typical socialist will be like, well, this party can't really represent the group's interests because the group's interests are spontaneous and they're not this like ideology that a party can verbalize, uh, mm-hmm. which gets at the problem of something being serial because for Sartre, something is serial when it's this it has this kind of inertia quality to it. It's like rote repetition, serial, like every day serial. Um, I'm getting some of that information from looking at uh, Guattari's thing um, about Laborde, where he talks about trying to like resist seriality in the context of an institution for mental health. Um, so something serial when it's like you have a, the same routine every day, right? Or the workplace, it's the same thing every day. Um, I think that's, the core of what seriality is, but I might be mistaken because I'm not, I'm not super into SART. Mm -hmm. Well, and I I would ask if that, that flows into, they have the, the line, the problem is situated there between unconscious group desires and pre-conscious class interests. Uh, The idea they seem to be shitting on is that a class exists at an individual unconscious or pre-conscious level. That's the fallacy, that there is no such thing. And it's in that sense, there is only group spontaneity, not class spontaneity. The the class is not a thing a person necessarily belongs to, but instead a a group we place people into at at a molar level, not molecular. I think that's well put because um, it reminds me of what they say at the end, at the start of the last paragraph, right? Uh, that is why the problem of a proletarian class belongs, first of all, to praxis. The task is to organize the bipolarity of the social field. It's like uh, classes are something that has to be produced by the left. And that would go with, so then their response to Sartre's analysis saying that it's correct is saying, look, there can be group Spontaneity, but the idea that class is this sort of predefined group that exists on a preconscious level is false. Uh, they say they go on to say Reich always comes back to us with his innocent standards, claiming the rights of a prior distinction between desire and interest. Uh, leadership as a task no more urgent, besides that of acquiring precise understanding, of objective historical process, understanding what are the desires of pe- of groups of people and what are the fears and traditional bonds of the uh, that prevent these things from developing. It's Basically, they're going back to almost this ethnology version of things that is very simple, very driven by people's sort of base desires and what is blocking them. That would be something that sort of goes against the concept that there is a class consciousness almost. Yeah, they're leveraging Reich against uh, leftists, which is interesting. Uh, And then they're also with that last sort of parenthetical putting forward, you know, their idea of desire always being revolutionary. The, the use of the word spontaneity here also brings up, um, uh, I, I I was reading a a lot of Sy uh, because I was reading about his, his writing on Greeley and lawns right before we started, I was mentioning it, but a lot of the early Islamist teachings talk about that, class spontaneity the 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 act that will cause people to become aware of how awful their lives are the spontaneous sort of uh enlightenment that can happen through a singular act is is what a lot of uh, sort of islamist teachings talk about um sounds almost like blankest like early anarchist you know the the black hand and these kind of like russian groups it it is and and they seem to be talking like it just when they use the word uh there does not exist any class spontaneity but only group spontaneity then they go on to talk about we need to understand what are the desires of any specific groups uh for progressive movement and what are the things stopping those desires that's how you generate spontaneity it seems like just their use of spontaneity here just in that time frame it's around the same timing as the end of Sai Kutub's life uh, and his writings becoming semi more popular and just in general a lot of that sort of you know, the idea of spontaneous uprising and revolution I, I pasted quite a wall of text in the chat but I just found this little thing outlining Sartre's group formations seriality group hmm. infusion organized group and institutions I don't think we should read the whole thing, but just the end of that first paragraph kind of 
just explains, I think, where the idea of the group infusion comes. Um, so Please we, we give it a read. Point that. Uh, here, I'll just read this quick. Um, the overall logical movement Sartre describes in his analysis can be summarized as follows. The atomized crowd of seriality is the ground of all collective relations. It is the normal collective relation between individuals. The individuals of the series do not help one another realize their individual goals. The series is a loose connection of individuals who just happen to be engaged in the same activity. If, however, there is an explicit threat to each individual, each individual's practice, praxis or practical activity spontaneously combines to combat the same external threat. The common intentionality of each individual's praxis creates an organic and spontaneous common praxis that Sartre names the group infusion. So I think that is kind of connected to when they say the class is serial. That's sort of like... They're, they're almost saying, you know, just because, you know, these people are unified by the the mode of production that they're engaged in, uh, d- does that necessarily mean that, like Brooks was saying, there's this identifiable sort of a class there that can be mined? Or is it like, I think, was it Muskie or someone was saying? It's sort of something that has to be created. But I think they're kind of saying there's a contradiction there because in the previous pages, their whole thing was, well, the, the really the only class in this kind of hyperbolic way is the bourgeoisie. They're the only class that has been capable of doing this mass decoding and, you know, shifting yeah. class systems and stuff. So I, I just wanted to note, you know, it's a quite a little thing here at the end of the paragraph. The It's kind of like inverting that Goebbels uh, whoever that was, that statement right in the Nazi party of when I hear culture, I pull out my gun, my gun. So there, it, it's another it seems like they're kind of sly, ironically or quite like uh, indirectly. They're criticizing, uh, you know, socialist leadership there, which I, th- I thought was interesting. It's actually a really, really damning sort of <laughs> their view of socialist leadership and even the famous ones. Uh, They really take them to task here, Um, but they continue to. And I'm going to continue to the next paragraph because these things start flowing into each other pretty quickly. Uh, Desire can never be deceived. Interests can be deceived, unrecognized or betrayed, but not desire. Whence Reich's cry. No, the masses were not deceived. They desired fascism, and that is what has to be explained. It happens that one desires against one's own interests. Capitalism profits from this, but so does socialism, the party, and party leadership. How does one explain that desire devotes itself to operations that are not failures of recognition, but rather perfectly reactionary, unconscious investments? And what does Reich mean when he speaks of traditional bonds? The latter also belong to the historical process and bring us back to the modern functions of the state. Civilized modern societies are defined by processes of decoding and deterritorialization. But what they deterritorialize with one hand, they re-territorialize with the other. These neo-territorialities are often artificial, residual, archaic. But they are, they are archaisms. Having a perfectly current function, our modern way of imbricating, sectioning off, of reintroducing code fragments, resuscitating old codes, inventing pseudocodes or jargons, neo-archaisms, as Edward Moore, Edgar Morin puts it, neo archaisms, as Edward Moore, I'm not going to be able to say this. It's like a tongue twister for me. These modern archaisms are extremely complex and varied. Some are mainly folkloric, but they nonetheless represent social and potentially political forces, from domino players, home brewers, by the veterans of foreign war. Uh, is that a paragraph break for anyone else? No, I don't think. Oh, yeah. Uh, Others are enclaves whose archaism is just as capable of nourishing a modern fascism as of freeing a revolutionary charge. The ethnic minorities, the Basque problem, the Irish Catholics, the Indian reservations. Some of these archaisms take form as if spontaneously in the very current of the movement of deterritorialization. Neighborhood territorialities, territorialities of the large aggregates, gangs. Others are organized or promoted by the state, even though they might turn against the state and cause it serious problems. Regionalism, nationalism. The fascist state has been without doubt capitalism's most fantastic attempt at economic and political re-territorialization. But the socialist state also has its own minorities, its own territorialities, which reform themselves against the state, or which the state instigates and organizes. 
Russian nationalism, the territoriality of the party, the proletariat was only able to constitute itself as a class of the basis of artificial neo-territorialities. In parallel fashion, the bourgeoisie re-territorializes itself in forms that are at time the most archaic. Uh, back to the con- concept very simply, that people actually desire fascism, that fascism is what people want. Good to get back to. But uh, neo-territorialities and neo-archaisms and Edgar Morin. Who, does anyone have Edgar Morin? Uh, a little quick explanation would be great. I mean, Alyosha, for sure. You're excited to see Edward Morin. I see, I see in the chat. So if you could give us a, a short. I mean, I have his um, Wikipedia often. <laughs> and it doesn't say much that helps me putting him into relation to what we just read. <laughs> no, it didn't help at all. And I think short of like actually really being familiar with his work. Um, that's great. <laughs> well, he came up with the term neo-archaisms, apparently. Apparently he came up with neo-archaisms, which is uh, uh, like a design methodology called Retro Futura. Uh, fun little things that are sort of semi self contradictory. Uh, one comment I wanted to make was uh, this uh, that sentence in italics there, but what they deterritorialize with one hand, they re territorialize with the other. I'm wondering if this isn't starting to like finally reveal what the heck they were talking about in the very first section with the like. The system of stones moving from one pocket to the other. I uh, wonder if that was like sort of foreshadowing for their description of deterritorialization and reterritorialization. I I would love to know. So they, they, they when they go into their examples of neo territorialities, uh, which they then call neo archaisms. Uh, uh, they say they're possibly folkloric, and they nonetheless represent social and potentially political forces. And they start rambling through what a handful of these might be. I want to know why domino players is in their fucking list. I, I thought that was just like painting a picture of like what someone would do at a VFW house. <laughs> they homebrew at a VFW house? Yeah, I don't know what they do over there. <laughs> I have no idea. I've I've That's been to concerts slant. at VFWs. I've been drinking at VFWs. I've never seen a home brewer there, and uh, I didn't know people played dominoes there. Um, I can see this as like the old guys in the park, you know, playing dominoes, or maybe outside their VFW. But then they go on. So from there, they then go on to say that there's other enclaves of archaism uh, just as capable of nourishing a modern fascism. Ethnic minorities, Basque problem, Irish Catholics, Indian reservations. Um, And then they add others uh, that are current in the movement of deterritorization. Neighborhoods, uh, gangs, large aggregates of people. Um, And then they've got regionalism and nationalism. Uh, other archaisms that are promoted by the state of America right now. We have the Proud Boys and Militias as an example that would come feel like it, it, it hits that sort of very specific thing they're talking about here. But uh, how, how does this apply to what the fuck else they're talking about? <laughs> Well, I was thinking about that. If you look at the beginning of the paragraph, they're, they're talking, they're saying desire can't be deceived. You can go against your interests, but desire is something that, you know, propels towards something that it, it actually wants, some kind of investment. Or they say reactionary, unconscious investment. So I guess what they're trying to say is, you know, if you think about all these things, it's like their earlier question in this chapter where they're like, well, if this is how capitalism is, why isn't the schizophrenic like the capitalism's hero? You know, you would think that if if they share so many similarities in their form and the way they work, then these things should be hand in hand. So I feel like this section is similar where it's saying, well, okay, so capitalism is this system that decodes all these things and, you know, unleashes all these new potentials. But then how is it possible for these other things which seem to look like, I guess they're calling them archaisms, but like their territorialities that seem somehow uh, anachronistic, like how come they're still there? 
And I guess they're sort of to what I see is that they're kind of establishing the point that. Well, are they? So I'm gonna, I want to I want to focus on that. I'm not sure it's anachronistic would be the the phrase that works for them because they 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 specifically in the translation use archaism. And that just means uh, old. It means uh, out of place, but slightly old. But it's not as bad as an anachronistic, like, oh, fuck, that doesn't belong here at all. It's a digital watch in in 1902. It it seems to be much more, uh, I don't know, nostalgia. Sure. Yeah, perhaps. Um, You know, I was taken by the, you know, they say folkloric. Um, but yeah, the, and I mean, I guess I'm thinking of the examples they give when they say they're saying the ethnic minorities themselves, I think they mean like, you know, all the social and political forces around that, the boss problem, Irish Catholics, like I'm thinking of, you know, the, the ETA in, in Spain evolving from a pseudo Marxist, like liberatory movement to one that just like rampantly just bombed civilians and the DUP and, you know, the orange freaking brigades in Northern Ireland and, you know, all the ways that I guess, they're, they're trying to they're trying to say and I suppose you could think of them intervening in debates of this time where, you know, they're like the, the Maoists and Sartre's camp and all these people where it's kind of like I think there's a lot of uh, apologia for revolutionary violence or what's perceived as like justified violence. And I feel like they might be setting up this thing of like, well, you know, you can clearly see that. You know, these don't all constitute like noble classes that are liberating themselves from the chain of history. Like they're, they intersect. With, sometimes they're these groups and fusions. Sometimes they're other things. I, I may, maybe I'm projecting. That's kind of where I see it going. No, and I think well. So that sentence specifically, others are enclaves whose archaism is just as capable of nourishing modern fascism as of freeing a revolutionary charge. And let's leave ethnic minorities out because I don't want to say anything too problematic. But if we talk about say the Irish Catholics. The, the if you've been to Ireland, uh, Irish Catholics in Ireland are very archaist. They are old school. It is it is like a little bit stepping back in time, depending on where you go. However, during this time period, especially these years, but I mean, God, leading up through the eighties uh, or through the troubles, uh, the idea of them nourishing a modern fascist or being revolutionary, I think, is what they're they're talking about. Kind of the desire sits in this archaistic place. Now, their interests of fascism versus revolutionary, that's not a desire thing. That's an interest thing. The archaism can go either direction. You know, what's funny, too? I didn't even occur to me. This was what, 72? Yeah. Uh, so this was actually before Franco died in Spain. Yes. So this was actually a period when and I don't know when they killed, but killed Carrero Blanco, who was the, you know, the, the prime minister leading up. He was going to be Franco's like successor. There was a time. So it's actually, I think, quite prescient of them. <laughs> In a way, because that this is a time when there's, I think, still a lot of sympathy for the boss. Blanco died the year after this book was published. What's that? Blanco died the year after this was published. Yeah, yeah. So it's just interesting in the sense of they're they're right in the midst of these sort of debates. Yeah, all of this is alive and very well. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, great. Um, I'm trying to think of this uh, question that they pose uh, early on in the paragraph where it says, um, how does one explain that desire devotes itself to operations that are not failures of recognition, but rather perfectly reactionary unconscious investments? Um, So what this is making me think of is, so in Marxism, there's this theory of false consciousness, right? Why does the proletariat act against its interests? Well, there's a kind of um, a kind of brainwashing almost going on. An ideology is placed on the proletariat, and they think that you know if they vote libertarian and uh, government is the big evil, you know uh, that that's their real interests, and that's a failure of recognition. That's a confusion, right? And um, I think what they're doing here is they're challenging that theory. And they're saying, no, that's not the real explanation. It's actually, there is this perfectly reactionary unconscious investment. And um, so, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, when, so when they talk about the um, unconscious in other works, uh, Deleuze himself, right, he will say the unconscious has this power of repetition. It just wants to repeat. And it just, so there's something like an inherently conservative uh, power that it has. And, um, 
I wonder if that's that's what they're getting at here that you know we need to be looking to that like to the nature of the unconscious to understand you know why um, people you know vote for fascism the proletariat you know votes for fascism and they even say even in a communist society you have a similar dynamic kind of happening um, so yeah and it's it's it, it also sounds like maybe the whole idea of interest for them would be like a construction like a like an eatable thing you know uh because interest presupposes like some vision of reality or you know this is what i really need never mind what i want you know that's what's really good for me and i don't know if that really squares well with their um with their approach no i i i like it and it's it I'm going to reading through that sort of thinking as a lens. If we talk about the sentence instead a little bit earlier in the paragraph, what, what they deterritorialize with one hand, they reterritorialize with the other. These neo territorialities, these newly created territories are artificial, residual and archaic, but they are archaisms having a perfectly current function, a way of imbricating or sectioning off, reintroducing code fragments, resuscitating old codes, inventing pseudo codes or jargons. Uh, so if we have our unconscious and our unconscious is trying to get out there, the, the way things are re-territorialized around us uh, gives us a chance to have those, well, the desires may not be fucked up, but that sort of uh, underlying subconscious, the, our unconscious uh, is being told the shape again. I, we get back to that thing that they said Oedipus is doing and that capital is doing, that it inserts itself as a sort of pre-conscious uh, reality. And so over time, because we're able to re-territorialize these old things, but new new territorializations happen, but they happen in a shape that's reminiscent of older things, the nostalgia, the way things used to be, the things that worked and they were they were cool. I think of uh uh the Oh God! There's there's so many things that are popping into my head right now. This is really. I'm going to read uh, Alyosha. I'm going to read your uh, section and then Al dreams because I think the the listeners should because we're having a great conversation in chat. I don't want it lost. Um, we should revisit pages on interest. There was a whole section on that. Reactionary unconscious investment might not be might not be fully conscious and rational, but it does correspond to real desire. We could say. Like the whole Trump follower thing when they suddenly get fucked over while well, he's hurting the wrong people, which reveals reactionary investment, which is to pe want people to be harmed. It's not a false recognition. They believe and want people to be harmed, just not themselves. Aldrin's replies, right, the unconscious is both repetition and difference, so it has both potentials. They always go hand in hand, and repetition is meant to be creative, uh, which is a core delusion principle, actually. Repetition is natural is the art of creation. It it spawns it. And I don't know if a conservative would be the put it, but there's a repetition is naturally based on the old because you have to have the thing that's there before. I don't know if I'd say it's necessarily conservative, but that it does rely on in some way, depending on how fast you want to talk about something being older, at archaisms. And so if uh, something is new territory is brought out uh, and that new territory, territorialism uh, sort of has the old shit inside of it, there's a, I don't know, that's, that's hmm, I feel like I'm hitting on something. Someone jump in, please. I wonder if maybe we need to sort of sh think about that more and come back to it because I, I followed Aldream's point, but I'm wondering if... Because we were talking about, you know, Deleuze's whole idea of difference and differentiation, which is like the base of a lot of his discussions of like being and the unconscious and stuff. So I wonder if maybe is conservative the right word here? Maybe we're getting stuck on that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I think I agree with your intention. I think the word is something we definitely like. I think I know what you're trying to say. It's a, but the words I think are going to be important. Let's uh, let's save that for also put a pin in it for review. Let's continue to the next paragraph unless anyone has any last things to say. Uh, because it's a short paragraph. Um, the famous personalization of power is like a territoriality that accompanies the deterritorialization of the machine as its other side. If it is true that the function of the modern state is the regulation of the decoded, deterritorialized flows, 
one of the principal aspects of this, one of the principal aspects of this function consists in re-territorializing so as to prevent the decoded flows from bre breaking loose at all the edges of the social axiomatic. One sometimes has the impression that the flows of capital would willingly dispatch themselves to the moon if the capitalist state were not there to bring them back to Earth. For example, deterritorialization of the flows of financing, re-territorialization of purchasing power and the means of payment, role of central banks, or the movement of deterritorialization that goes from the center to the periphery is accompanied by a peripheral re-territorialization, a kind of economic and political self-centering of the periphery, either in the modernistic forms of the state socialism or capitalism, or in the archaic form of local despots. It may be all but impossible to distinguish deterritorialization from re-territorialization, since they are mutually enmeshed, or like opposite faces of one in the same process. Um, I'm going to start with the question on the first sentence. Uh, the famous personalization of power is like a territoriality that accompanies the deterritorialization de de of the machine. What is personalization of power? Refer to? Because it's famous and I don't know it. Does this have to do... I'm going to try and find this. Wasn't there a section where they, they say the thing about uh, man becoming fully private or something like that? Yeah, here it is. Is it? Um, 251. Uh, that's kind of how I'm reading it. Um, from 250 to 251. Moreover, despite the abundance of identity cards, files, and other means of control, capitalism does not even need to write in books to make up for the banished banish body markings. Those are only relics, archaisms with a certain function. The person has become private in reality insofar as he derives from abstract quantities and becomes concrete in the becoming concrete of these same quantities. I know that, that that doesn't seem quite like that, but I kind of read that as maybe the personalization of power is sort of like the modern, I don't know, biopolitical subject kind of. Yeah, no, it's not a fully formed thought, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think you're onto something there because I had I did a quick Google and um, personalism is a sort of philosophical branch. Uh, the dictionary definition is pretty illuminating. It says. Uh, personalism is a system of thought which maintains the primacy of the human or divine person on the basis that reality has meaning only through the conscious mind. Uh, can sort of see how that resonates with fascism and the sort of privatization and becoming concrete of individuals. So uh, also it tends to, from what I've, I've been able to read, I, I did a little bit of Googling on this, but I couldn't find anything useful, but it's, uh, basically, the general use of power not becoming something of the state, but instead being personalized in a figure, uh, a charismatic leader, for example, um, or uh, in a democracy, you would say that power is personalized all the way to how it affects me, Brooks, uh, as a voter, and the, that's personalized to that extent. So it's very much seeing the eyes through a singular subject, uh, political subject. Does this um, <laughs> moon statement not feel prescient as well? Like I'm thinking about not just like actual, you know, NASA programs, but Elon Musk. Elon Musk, that. yeah. <laughs> and uh, in a way, maybe it sheds light on that personalization of power in, in that sense of like, the you know, Elon Musk as a capitalist, as a person uh, involved in these flows who can kind of just make this initiative. And go go to Reddit, and there is a series of threads you can read that are extraordinary pieces of cult management. Like, really, uh, about would you travel to Mars uh, with SpaceX? Uh, enough must explain it is wonderful. But uh, if you would travel to Mars with SpaceX, knowing you wouldn't come back, which is a hell of a thing, and the number of people and how they talk about it and why they would be proud to do it, um, I, I don't think that... Deleuze had a cynical enough view of humanity. If he's, oh, well, just as uh, well, maybe you have the impression that the flows of capital would willing to dispatch themselves to the moon if the if the state were no, they would, they would, they would just go there and they would die there. Be okay with that. Um, but uh, so the the first half of this is uh, to, to sort of restate and bring us back. The famous personalization of power is like a territoriality that accompanies the deterritorialization of the machine as its other side. Uh, the modern state is the regulation of the decoded to territorialized flows 
One of the principal aspects of this function consists in re-territorializing so as to prevent decoded flows from breaking loose all its edges in social ax axiomatic. Um, the thing they are talking about here is what? Uh, I got that this is a like kind of a restatement of what they were talking about in the last paragraph, but maybe in a more general way, right? Where um, the um, personalization of power is the re-territorialization that accompanies, accompanies the deterritorialization of the political machine. Uh, oh, as yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. That would make more sense because they were talking about the political machine in the previous paragraph. Sorry, go on, yeah, please. I think one way to read that is that, like, you know, basically whatever you're trying to do at some point, you have to come back to, I need money to buy food and shelter to survive. There's always this re-territorialization, no matter how schizophrenic you try to get in your creative activity. Well, and it's, it's that natural use of the axiomatic that as we approach the, what feels like an infinite horizon, when we, when we expand outside of what capital is capable of or understands, at some point we need to be basically reabsorbed back into that re-territorialized, no matter what it is, at some point this will happen. This, no matter how schizo you may be uh, sort of believing or acting or producing. Uh, well, I want to respond to that because I think that's the axiomatic, right? I, I was sort of, we were reading the last paragraph about re-territorialization and deterritorialization, and it seemed sort of unsatisfying to just posit that like, well, every time you deterritorialize, you will be re-territorialized. And I think that they finally responded to that. Like, we're not just saying that because like, we want there to be this inherently conservative tendency to society. Uh, and then the sentence where they say like, if it is true that the function of the modern state is the regulation of decoded to territorialized flows, one of the principal aspects of this function consists in re-territorializing. That's where they finally give the explanation for why. But that that's where they respond to the sort of movement as it goes back and forth between the two. And they sort of posit, this is why it's happening. Because if you follow the logic of deterritorialization all the way to its conclusion, it would, you know, capitalism would become unstable. The flows of capital would go to the moon. The state has to be there to be like, no, you're not using your energy that way. We, we're going to check you in with these re-territorializations, whether it's like national or uh, class-based or whatever. Either in modernistic forms of state socialism or capitalism or in the archaic forms of local despots. It may be all but impossible to distinguish deterritorialization from reterritorialization since they are mutually enmeshed or like opposite faces of one and the same process. But they're, they're about to dive into uh, even further uh, regulation of the state and the role of the state. So I'm actually going to move on to the next paragraph. Uh, at some point, we will get through this section, I promise. This essential aspect of the regulation performed by the state is even more readily understood. <clears throat> If one sees that it is directly based on the social and economic axiomatic of capitalism as such, it is the very conjunction of the deterritorialized flows that delineates archaic or artificial neo-territorialities. Marx has shown what was the foundation of political economy, properly speaking, the discovery of an abstract subjective essence of wealth in labor or production, and in desire as well, it would seem. It was an immense step forward for Adam Smith to throw out every limiting specification of wealth creating activity, not only manufacturing or commercial or agricultural labor, but one as well as others, labor in general, the abstract universality of wealth creating activity. Here we have the great movement of decoding or deterritorialization. The nature of wealth is no longer to be sought on the side of the object under exterior conditions in the territorial or despotic machine. But Marx is quick to add that this essentially cynical discovery finds itself rectified by a new territorialization in the form of a new fetishism or new hypocrisy. Production as the abstract subjective essence is discovered only in the forms of property that objectivize it all over again, that alienates it by re-territorializing it. Although they had a presentment of the subjective nature of wealth, the mercantilists had determined it as a special activity still tied to money-creating despotic machine. The physiocrats, pushing this presentiment still further, had tied subjective activity to a territorial or re-territorializing machine in the form of agriculture and landed property. 
And even Adam Smith discovers the great essence of wealth, abstract and subjective, industrial and deterritorialized, only by immediately re-territorializing it in the private ownership of the means of production. No one can say in this regard that so-called common ownership changes the direction of this movement. Moreover, if it is not a question of writing the history of political economy, but the real history of the corresponding society, one is better able to understand why capitalism is continually re-territorializing with one hand as what it is deterritorializing with the other. Okay, let's uh, try to break this down but again. Um, Really quick, Muskie, I know you're leaving. Uh, let's get, can I get 30 seconds? Because we were just having the discussion in the previous paragraph uh, where you said specifically that they were trying to show that there's more to re-territorialization and deterritorialization than that. This feels like they're saying the opposite. They've actually said, no, actually, they're the nature of capitalism and the nature of all of these things, that we have no choice but to have deterritorialization followed by re-territorialization consistently under everything that's happening. Sorry, where are you getting this, uh, that's all that this is uh, out of uh, this paragraph? Uh, so, I mean, they basically are restating multiple times that uh, we deterritorialize and then immediately a new territory pops up and new fetishism or new hypocrisy. And they go through a series of examples that ne- that basically uh, things are territor- deterritorialized, and then immediately a new territorialization machine comes, and it's, it forms and how they show up, uh, and that basically they're what part and parcel of the same process under capitalism. That's how I'm reading this section. Feel free to tell me that I'm wrong. Don't worry. That's probably true. It's just what it feels like to me. Well, I think what Muskie was saying was that it felt like the conclusion was unsatisfying initially because it sort of seemed contrarian for for the sake of it, but that they it seemed like they were delving into it more in these sections and kind of explaining how it's I don't know imminent. That's the word they always like to use, isn't it? <laughs> imminent to capital's axiomatics themselves. I, I'm trying to understand it as well. I don't know if Doug, you were going to say something. I was just seeing the. When they say it is the very conjunction of the deterritorialized flows that delineates archaic or artificial neo territorialities. So, like, it, I guess, in the sense that you, you can't just have, you know, just purely deterritorialized flows would, would not work for capitalism. And then that next paragraph, I feel like this is the important point, which I don't fully grasp. But I feel like I, I kind of get what they're saying when they say production as the abstract subjective essence is discovered only in the forms of property that objectify it all over again that alienates it by re-territorializing it i feel like that is the key to kind of explaining that but i don't understand it. it's that same sentence that i'm stuck on and how i'm interpreting the entire the entire paragraph feels like it can be summed up in that same sentence it is the very conjunction of the deterritorialized flows that delineates archaic or artificial neo territoriality now i read that and how i read this because it feels like it's a series of explanations or examples of that sentence sort of expanded out is that the actual conjunction of the de- of the flows of desire that are fully deterritorialized those are where, actually, we delineate archaic or artificial neo-territorialities. And as I said in the last paragraph, neo-territorialities are the re-territorialization. So it's the one hand, the other hand. I think I'm actually get, sort of getting this because and I was doing some supplemental reading on this. Like the, the move that Marx does by locating the abstract wealth process in the, the actual worker and in the act of production and, and their labor value is this sort of, it's not an inversion, but it's an expansion on all these previous economic theories. And I think what they're referring to here in the re-territorialization is actually sort of like capital's self-narrative in a a way. So you have, in in a sense, you know, like moving from despotic modes and like freeing the serfs and all the rest of it to a modern worker proletarian subject that can just so-called sell their labor value. This is the, they said this great movement of decoding or deterritorialization. Wealth is no longer to be sought on the side of the object under exterior conditions. But then rather than, I, I suppose for Marx, like go the distance and see then that it's the, you know, uh, labor power itself within embodied in that like 
subject, or I guess suppose in the in the one involved in production, then it's sort of that narrative, like capital and its economists and pe- people who study it. Sort of, there's a, n- a new hypocrisy. They kind of re-territorialize it by saying, "Oh no, no!" But it's actually, it's this special activity tied to money creating, or it's it's about you know land ownership, or it's you know these these different theories. I guess the, I, f- I feel like that's what they're kind of getting at there. All right, this is a uh, let's make a note of it for. Uh, I've got questions here, but it's I think it's for a review because I think we're just going to be. A lot. Uh, yes, Alyosha, that's that's actually how it feels like to me that basically it's it's territorialization all the way down. And it always was. I guess, uh, Brooks, that, that sentence you're reading, it's the very conjunction of the deterritorialized flows that delineates archaic or artificial neo territory ter- ter- territorialities. Um, I guess, the, so what they're saying here, uh, the way I'm making sense of this is that uh, they need to explain the neo-territorialization neo-territori- through the, that same field of imminence, right? They need to, uh, their explanation needs to be, you know, kind of stemming out of the machine itself. And so this is, this is why... Okay, um, it's the same deliberated flows are coming together in a certain conjunctions, and that's how the new territor- territorialities are, are constructed. Like it's all sort of happening within the same machine. It's just it's sort of a, one of its, um, I guess, one of its modalities. But I think at the same time, it's that's what's unique about uh, capitalism for them is that it's a, it's at the same time also decoding and deterritorialization all the way down. That uh, you know the the only class are these people decoding decoding the flows, and they themselves are being decoded by uh, you know others. Um, and the only territory are these conjunctions on these decoded flows, which are themselves you know deterritorializing so it's it's yeah that delirium that we'll get into in a little bit uh, it's worth we, we will have to come back to it because i think once we start having any of these paragraphs where they are using these terms basically uh, almost insanely com- competing against each other territorialization deterritorialization neo-territoriality re-territorialization there's got to be a, a different way to get these points across to make them something that, uh, I don't know, is, is a little bit more digestible. Because I'm where I get stuck is uh, the first half starts to make sense to me. I read that one sentence where it's like, okay, cool, I get this. But then as they start getting to the, the nature of wealth is no longer to be sought on the side of the object under exterior conditions. But Marx is quick to add this essentially cynical discovery finds itself rectified by a new territorialization in the form of a new fetishism or new hypocrisy. I don't have a reference for this almost at all in my brain that makes me understand what they're talking about. So, okay, so now they're talking about Marx. So it goes back into dialectics. Right. Uh, right. So basically, they're actually trying to find an alternative to the uh, uh, the idea of the dialectics in Marx. Um, and when they're saying a new fetishism, it passes from the object to the surplus value and uh, the, the capital. So the fetishism is into the capital and not into the object itself. So when they're talking into this manner, it's really confusing because I've, I've, I've broken my brain on this also previously. And um, so, so it's a way to escape uh, the binary kind of thing and make it processual. And just one thing that maybe like maybe it's a reification on my part, but uh, it's it's it, it's uh, there's a better explanation of this uh, the assemblages in in the Tazon Plateau when they said the assemblage is material, social, and um, semiotic. So when um, uh, what's it's uh, Ayo, uh, Alyosha that said that before it's a discursive retorialization, but it's it's just not discursive. It's the whole process that is being decoded and recoded as um, 
um, I'm I'm kind of lost right now. I just lost it. But like it does, it's 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 the it's the whole machine that is moving. You know, it, it's just not the, the 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 words that we put on it or the, the discursive aspect. It's how the flux are being redirected and recoded. I, that's kind of what I was saying in the chat, though. Like uh, the reason I was I use that word is just because the uh, the reason I think it's confusing the way it's written is that. You know, they're talking about processes of capital in the world and they say and then it's re-territorialized. And so in my mind, I'm immediately going to, okay, in what ways are those enclosures or those different how, you know, the actual processes. But then it seems to be that the point that they're making is about, you know, it it finds itself uh, in the form of a fetishism or a new hypocrisy. So I actually in the class in the chat, I clarified trying to say that you know maybe we the, the reason it's not you're right it's all together and it's not separate is because this is kind of like the recording of production you know the, that which is also part of the process of production anyway so it's not different i just f- felt for our purposes because it made a lot more sense to me when you when you can just see that they're trying to intervene in the that kind of self narrative that capital has about what it's doing uh, which is what I, th- I think is what they're saying here when they're, when they're saying the physiocrats and the mercantilists and Adam Smith and the rest of it, rather than talking about re-territorialization as like, I don't know, the earlier examples of like enclaves, like an Indian reservation, for example. Yeah, and it, it's also a question of context. You know, this has been written in '72, so you know um, there was a transformation into the machines of production of the state toward like a global market. Also, so like it's when they're saying they're going to talk about it a little bit later when they say that it's been it's being reterritorialized. I don't know. Whatever. Territorialized. Uh, uh, yeah, I cannot say it in English. Um, but it it changes from like the local to the national to the planet scale. So there's it's it's a new process for them. What we've been like living through, it's still a new process. And that's what they're trying to describe. All right. I, I'm going to move on to the next uh, paragraph unless anyone has a final thought. In Capital, Marx analyzes the true reason for the double movement. On the one hand, capitalism can proceed only by continually developing the subjective essence of abstract wealth or production, sake of production. That is, production as an end in itself, the absolute development of the social productivity of labor. But on the other hand, and at the same time, it can do so only in the framework of its own limited purpose, as a determinant mode of production, production of capital, the self-expansion of existing capital. Under the first aspect, capitalism is continually surpassing its own limits, always deterritorializing further, displaying a cosmopolitan universal energy with overthrows every restriction and bond. But under the second, strictly complementary aspect, capitalism is continually confronting limits and barriers that are interior and imminent to itself, and that, precisely because they are imminent, let themselves be overcome only provided they are reproduced on a wider scale, always more re-territorialization, local, worldwide, and planetary. That is why the law of the falling tendency, that is, limits never reached because they are always surpassed and always reproduced, has seemed to us to have as a corollary and even as direct manifestation simultaneity of the two movements of deterritorialization and re-territorialism. So this goes back to uh, the dialectics of Marx uh, when he says that um, capitalism fixes itself through its contradictions. So basically there's a negative, you know, it's the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis in in Hegel that is uh, being uh, used by Marx. But it's the same kind of thing. It's the the two movement, and we're taking the new slang, the the t the t the, the deet and the re. Um, they are the three movements that are happening together, just not as like one contradiction and you know like um, producing from the negative. It's, there's also like a uh, a positive aspect of production into it. Okay, so I'm going to try saying that another way because I've been thinking about this when they talk about. Re, uh, deterritorialization with one hand and re-territorialization with the other. Uh, it feels like they're talking about things that happen in a series. But uh, another way to read this is that actually there's a simultaneity to it and that these things are effectively uh, happening at the same time. 
and because they're part of ultimately the same process. We may think of them machinically as happening in a line. Obviously, you have to deterritorialize before you reterritorialize. But effectively, uh, they are uh, happening at the same time, and they're consistent, and they're always happening. Wherever we find a paradox or we find a contradiction within capitalism, of which there are many, and we are always finding new ones, the nature of capital is it finds that contradiction, it deterritorializes the issues around it, removes the limit, and re-territorializes it into itself in the same effective thought. I'm going to leave this pregnant pause here because I need someone to respond to me. Yeah, I agree with uh, the way you you put it, Brooks. Um, I've been trying to sort of put flesh on what they're saying um, by, um, seems like there's the deterritorialization is something like the logic of the market. You know, markets, when they enter a territory, they lift people out of their sort of embedded codes um, and uh, basically dispossess people, right? Um, and so, so that's how the army of the proletariat gets created. But then that's only so that uh, a new owner can come in, you know, a, kind of a large scale property owner or, right? So the primitive accumulation, uh, like uh, Empty Set is saying, uh, you know, so with the enclosures of the of the commons, you know, people were could just use the pastures, you know, for their own flocks and whatever. Um, and then, but then the market created an opportunity for I think it was wool could be sold on a um, in the international market, and so all of a sudden, all these people are lifted out of the. Uh, um, off the land just so that it can be re-territorialized, right, by a private owner. Mm. And so, and I think this logic kind of just goes back and forth. Uh, And there's always this, you know, this kind of anonymous personality, the shareholder or the capitalist or the banker or, you know, who kind of stands behind, sort of outside the market, really. Um, And this is... You know, really, it's their their goal is to kind of get to own whatever property is uh, is available. Yeah, and I think like with regards to what Brooks was saying about the simultaneity of the things, that it's like as long as you've got this, uh, you know, condition set up where there is, you know, the banker or, or whoever uh, there alongside, uh, you know, the labor force, and they can just do it instantly, simultaneously. So it's just about the uh, conditions that are set up there. And I think it's 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 part and parcel, I think, of the nature of their body without organs that as they're talking about it, as capital exists, as this excess that exists, that's able to constantly do this. It's it's the nature of the machine, because I mean, these things have to happen in order. It's part of the machinic sort of setup is they have to happen in some semblance of order. But that in the same moment, it's assumed and accepted uh, an example would be the idea of mining space asteroids or going to Mars and never coming back, that there are reasons that you could do it and that you would bring these sort of axiomatics of capital with you. And so in that moment, you're deterritorializing fucking Mars and re-territorializing it as well. And in, I mean, in the same almost instance. All right, uh, to continue. An important consequence emerges from the above considerations. The social axiomatic of modern societies is caught between two poles and is constantly oscillating from one pole to the other. Born of decoding and deterritorialization on the ruins of the despotic machine, these societies are caught between the Urstadt that they would like to resuscitate as an overcoding and re-territorializing unity and the unfettered flows that carry them towards an absolute threshold. They record with all their might, with worldwide dictatorship, local dictators, and an all-powerful police while decoding, or allowing the decoding of, the fluent quantities of their capital and their populations. They are torn in two directions, archaism and futurism, neo-archaism and ex-futurism, paranoia and schizophrenia. They vacillate between two poles, the paranoiac despotic sign, sign signifier of the despot that they try to revive as a unit of code and the sign figure of the schizo as a unit of decoded flux, a schiz, a point break or flow break. 
They try to hold on to the one, but they pour out or flow out through the other. They are continually behind or ahead of themselves. Uh, Suzanne de Brunoff, footnote I want to read. That is why in capitalism, even credit formed into a system brings together composite elements that are both anti-capitalist, money, money commerce, and post-capitalist, the credit circuit being an, a higher circulation. Adapted to the needs of capitalism, credit is never really contemporary with capital. So a financing born of the capitalist mode of production remains a bastard. I will, I will echo Alyosha, this feels on and it feels accurate to today's feel, issues. Sorry, go ahead. Doesn't this feel like exactly like the, I mean, I'm just thinking about the, you know, all the kind of like hand wringing over, where is all this right wing and like, where's fascism coming from? I thought we had democracy and stuff like this feels like exactly the kind of thoughts and feelings I've had about, you know, the, the way that these societies and our modern societies are kind of like chasing their own tail and unable to sort of like understand how they, both like instantiate the violence that they condemn and like try to escape it. Uh, it's just really, really interesting. Yeah, that makes sense a lot because uh, at the same time, all the French theory at the time was uh, being critical of uh, the idea of progress and the uh, linearity of time also. So in, in this when they say anti-capitalism, which is like pre-capitalism and post-capitalism and saying that there's like neo-territorialities, but like also archaic, archaic territorialities, they're always present at all time. They're always there. It's just the intensity that is different. So it, it gives us like a complete different idea of time and of possibilities that could emerge from uh, the context or the, uh, the pure immanence of, uh, of a territory. Do you think we can shelve this, but do you think this connects to the virtual at all for them then? Because if, if it is a thing of, you know, that they, they sort of all these things are happening at once and it's not necessarily a linear progression that there's sort of all these different, both of the future ten oriented tendency and the archaic tendency, are, are they kind of like latent as virtual potentials that can kind of come out and be tapped into at different times does that make sense yeah totally and you know it's the difference between potentials and possibilities also you know the conditions they make the you know there's possibilities of there's um uh, there's possibilities of conditions but also the, 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 the current conditions wait i got a phone call coming in so go ahead and take that it's a no, I'm not taking it. Uh, <laughs> so, so, but um, the the possibilities um, that are offered by a context um, offer a way for certain potentialities. But the potentialities are always there. Capitalism could could die or could live forever. You know, like the, depending on what's happening. So, fascism can arise. You know, get a few protests and the rise of the police state, and you know, you get fascism coming back up. So I think it's I think it totally makes sense to actually put all of this into the virtual and, you know, in regard to the actual and the actual is always renewed through the possibilities offered by the virtual and the virtual is always renewed by the conditions of the actual. And what is the line of uh, the virtual is actual, but not real. It's real, real, but not actual. Yes. Sorry, I said it backward. I, mean, fuck, I thought I was going to have a profound moment. <laughs> God damn it, every time. Um, I'm going to continue us on, though. Uh, any other? I think being too hard on yourself about that uh, misstatement is a, is a microfascism, Brooks. So, yeah. <laughs> and I have, a, I have a lot of microfascism in me, trust me. Um, how can the nostalgia for and the necessity of the Orstadt be reconciled with the insistence and the inevitability of the fluxion of the flows? What can be done so the decoding and the deterritorialization constitutive of the system do not make it flee through one end or another that would escape the axiomatic and throw the machine into a panic? Chinese on the horizon, a Cuban missile launcher, an Arab hijacker, a console kidnapper, a Black Panther, a May 68, or even stoned hempies and angry gays. I like that last one a lot. The, time, the timing is so specific to the 1972, it's ridiculous. Um, 
There is an oscillation between the reactionary paranoiac overcharges and the subterranean schizophrenic and revolutionary charges. Moreover, one no longer quite knows how it goes on one side or the other. The two ambiguous poles of delirium, their transformations, the way in which an archaism or folklore in a given set of circumstances can suddenly become charged with a dangerous progressive value. How things turn fascist or revolutionary is the problem of the universal delirium about which everyone is silent. First of all, and especially the psychiatrists, they have no idea on the subject. Why would they? Capitalism, and socialism as well, are as though torn between the despotic signifier that they adore and the schizophrenic figure that sweeps them along. We are thus entitled to maintain two conclusions they have already put forward and that seem to stand mutually opposed. On the one hand, the modern state forms a break that represents a genuine advance in comparison with the despotic state. In terms of its fulfillment of becoming imminent, its generalized decoding of flows, and its axiomatic that comes to replace the codes and overcodings. But on the other hand, there has never been but one state, the Urstadt, the Asiatic despotic formation, which constitutes in its shadow existence history's only break, since even the modern social axiomatic can function only by resuscitating it as one of the poles between which it produces its own break. Democracy, fascism, or socialism, which of these is not haunted by the Orstadt as a model without equal? The name of the local dictator Duvalier's chief of police was Desir. That yeah, baby Doc Duvalier, it's, uh, the, the picture I used uh, when I promoted and put up images of this was of uh, his group, the Tontons. Uh, they, the story of Haiti and, and Papa Doc and everything that happened there is... Uh, one of the more interesting and I think important parables of humanity that not a lot of people know. Because the story of the Duvaliers was really horrific, but appropriate to the democratically elected, uh, kept things in order, made things safe for people, butchered a shit ton of human beings. Like, what do you think the meaning of that sentence is? Why, why do they um, point out because, the chief of police's name? Okay, that's good because I'm the French guy and I will explain. Uh, <laughs> it, it is, it's specifically about French colonialism. Like it's, yeah, it's, yeah, but it, his name is Desire. Right. So basically fascism, you know, could be Desire as well. Uh, and Desire ran this, it, the, the chief of police, it, it's, it's a... I, again, I'm assuming a lot of this is them being very tongue in cheeky. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't like the chief of police, like standing out in front of people. He ran a secret police. He ran the. He ran the Tauntauns. He ran these awful, awful groups of human beings who went around and basically brutalized the entire country on behalf of him. And Luke Desire, uh, I've always pronounced him Desire, uh, but maybe I've, I've been wrong on that. Um, Again, uh, put in line by de- de- it, it, Haiti was a democracy. I don't think we've ever had any reason to believe that Papa Doc didn't get uh, actually elected. So the idea that desire wasn't put into place by the desire of the democratic electorate. Um, that's that's why I think it follows the line. Uh, democracy, fascism or socialism, which of these is not haunted by the Orstadt as a model without equal? Uh, so is it that not just desire is fascism, but that the earth dot is desired as well? And so that is yes. uh, going underneath all this. Yeah. This feels very relevant to to all the kind of like I'm thinking about stuff in the UK now with, uh, you know, whether it's complete right wing nostalgia for like the empire or even just kind of. You know, the, the popular mythology of like the, the crown and these TV shows about like the, the noble royal family and stuff of it, you know, in a way, I think and probably Deleuze and Guattari would agree with this, that, the, you know, there is no going back. There's no like we're, we're in the juncture that we're in. But there is this kind of continual fever of like, well, maybe, you know, maybe this, maybe you know, going between the that seemingly liberal or anarchic tendency towards like opening things up at the same time as saying, well, no, but we need. You know, especially in COVID times, we need everything to be locked down. We need them. We need military on the streets. We need them to be taking care of people. <laughs> I've heard many people say that, actually. 
because I think well that that ending and I think we've got the main point the the brunt of this I do want to go back to the uh, what can be done so that decoding and deterritorialization constitutive to the system do not make it flee through one end or another it would escape the axiomatic and throw it into a panic and then they give a whole bunch of I think uh, I'm guessing cheeky examples about oh here are things that would absolutely destroy the modern capitalist state um when in, that's kind of them being uh, uh, cheeky and laughing about it, I think. Am I wrong to think that? I just hear them in, like, in my mind, I hear this uh, sardonic French tone <laughs> in my head. Yeah, I think you're right. That was definitely something that I was a little confused about when I first read it. Why these, yeah, why the examples they chose, that makes sense, though. Yeah, I feel like it's just the it's the it's the panic of the the thing that represents, you know, the, the idea of its dissolution, like you said. And I, and that's why I think that the the Chinese on the horizon, which I think is not that hasn't changed. There's fewer missile launchers in Cuba. We still got the Arab hijackers, Black Panthers, or BLM. I like all of these things are the the horror that's going to ruin it all. And I just, I kind of like the stoned hippies and angry gays. We've lost the stoned hippies, but that's that trope of the angry gays is still absolutely something that portions of the Midwest really believe is a thing. This is what feminism wants, you know, wet ass pussies. Yes. What it wants. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, fuck. (laughs) I'm really curious about this. uh, So this continuum that they have, or this sort of polarity, between paranoia and uh, schizophrenia. Um, And the reason is that um, generally, as far as I know, schizophrenia and paranoia are like, they're part of the same condition, right? Uh, A person with schizophrenia tends to become paranoid and maybe vice versa. um, Because, you know, like psychotic break with reality creates that sense of sort of being watched or you know the world is out to get the person and uh, so I'm, I'm curious like uh they seem to want to really distinguish those two aspects um and um yeah so i guess it's just an observation more than anything um if, yeah it's hard for me to see exactly what the difference is so I, I think I can answer this because I, they're coming at it very much through the psychoanalytic lens of Freud and Lacan, uh, who came before them. And the way that these things have been viewed then versus, say, now, where we look at things more through psychotherapeutic means and neurological means, where that a, a paranoid schizophrenic, we've even combined the terms, uh, is the thing that exists, it is a bit different than their usage of it. Uh, when they talk about it, they're talking about, and, and feel free if anyone has a different understanding of this, jump in. They're talking about the the paranoiac knowledge and schizophrenic knowledge based in Freud and Lacan. Paranoiac knowledge is, uh, paranoiac is someone who, uh, in, during the mirror stage of their life, uh, they basically sit in a place where they, they realize they can't know everything. Uh, and it's natural. We all have some level of paranoia. We can't know everything. We can't even know ourselves. But a paranoiac uh, who kind of takes that to the dangerous position ends up basically making up how the world works in order to make the world seem like it fits uh, and seem like it works together. They're, they develop that. Uh, schizophrenic is someone who, in this sort of mode of thought, does the opposite, and they 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 instead embrace this, and they're able they they move between semiotics and relations in, in ways that are nonsensical. And the example they use early on uh, is, uh, uh, oh God, what's his name? The guy with the rain, the sun out his asshole. Someone, Schreber, Judge Schreber. Um, that, that's, that's the pure schizophrenic to them. People who see things sort of through this uh, non-semiotic based or non-reality based set of knowledge. So those, those to them are the two poles. And again, it's more Lacanian and Freud rather than, I would say, our understanding today or how we view psychotherapy. If that makes any sense. 
Yes, but also it's at the basis of social movements. So, you know, uh, I don't have a clear example of schizophrenic uh, organization. Maybe like uh, the queer spaces could be one. But at the at the, the right moment with COVID, you know, all the conspiracy theories behind them, it's people who are living in fear and it's people who are paranoid. And they're saying, you know, it's the pedo satanists that they're doing everything. You know, they give, uh, they connect the dots together to make an order. Um, Paranoia well, would be know. QAnon. QAnon's yeah, a, a Q, paranoiac Q-Anon's response, a, yeah. a, 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 schizo, a schizo version, uh, and I'm not saying it would be a successful one, but a, a corollary to that would be the Occupy movement, which had uh, absolutely almost, I mean, aside from doing very little, they, they had very little shared knowledge, shared goals, and they were spending time kind of trying to create a sort of egalitarian, like they had fuzzy ideas. That'd be the closest I'd come to saying that, that that had more of a schizo sort of bent to it versus QAnon on the other side. Is that fair, Alyosha? Sure. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, I think, yeah, like o- Occupy is an interesting example because I don't know if I'd say it's completely like it was a bit, you know, all over the place, but it, it, it wasn't militant for sure. But yeah, I think you could say in, in principle, the idea of those spaces of like the Indignados in Spain or Occupy, like those kinds of things. You know, would, would be schizo, schizo movements yeah. are extremely difficult to find. And I, I, I had this conversation with someone uh, a month or two ago here about how they're just there almost can't be one by definition, at least one that's pure schizo, because anytime there's a movement in a singular direction, which is necessary for any of these movements, it can't possibly be schizo. That's a fun little semantic argument, but it does make it very difficult to have this conversation. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I was like struggling to find one. But it's it's interesting that you are saying uh, about the um, the Occupy movement because it's a space of experiment. It's yeah. a space of experiment of practices, but also of thought. So basically, you're connecting things together and trying to make a new reality appear out of this coming together. While the fascist or you know the 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 QAnon or like the conspiracist, uh, they will say they they lock reality into yes. a structure. Yes. Well, I, I, I took part in Occupy, and so I should on myself a little bit uh, for that. Uh, it's a little bit self-effacing when I make fun of it, but um, it it very much didn't have a, at least from where I was participating, it did not have a, a any regimented set of rules or even an understanding of the world other than knowing we wanted something more, which I think the idea of the schizo existing on that horizon or skating around the body without organs, it had that emotion in it for sure. Whereas, and I've been around it in my father's, uh, you know, deep into the alt-right world. Um, it is a place of people who know everything. They fucking understand the world and I'm the idiot and they grasp it completely and it's hard and it's fast and it's concrete. And uh, it's a very different way of looking. So that's, that's to I'm, me, the two poles. I was just going to say with the movement thing, I almost feel like it's maybe the problem is trying to identify, okay, which is a schizo and a non schizo movement, because the way I would see it is almost like, cause even Deleuze and Guattari, they make sort of pay little gestures towards this, like almost Trotskyist idea of permanent revolution. But I would kind of see it in that way of less, you know, let's try and identify which are the more, which are the schizo movements and which are not, but, and more like there is a moment, there is a schizo kind of moment that is at the birth of any social movement, which is that like, like uh, Roger was saying of like the, the opening of this, you know, creative space. And in fact, Lazzarato kind of talks about it as a, as a withdrawal, uh, you know, this moment of withdrawal that allows for this mm. reorganization of sense temporarily. And then there's all these things that can happen afterwards, re-territorializations, all that stuff, but that it's kind of like a constituent moment of any break for it to, to have to go in that kind of direction. And then what happens with it? Cause yeah, I mean, you know, David Graeber who died recently, I think he, he, you know, there's some really interesting stuff that came out of the New York Occupy Wall Street. I was in Chicago and it was a total shit show. And a lot of the, you know, longtime, you know, community folks were kind of like, what the hell is going on here? But, you know, it's it, it had important effects that I think we were still felt to this day. So. Um, but to continue. But the events that restore a thing to life are not the same as those that give rise to it in the first place. We have distinguished among three social machines corresponding to the savage, the barbarian, and the civilized societies. The first is the underlying territorial machine, which consists in coding the flows on the full body of the earth. 
The second is the transcendent imperial machine, which consists in overcoating the flows on the full body of the despot or his apparatus, the Urstat. It affects the first great movement of deterritorialization, but does so by adding its eminent unity to the territorial communes that it conserves by bringing them together, overcoating them, and appropriating their surplus labor. The third is the modern eminent machine, which consists in decoding the flows on the full body of capital money. It has realized the eminence, it has rendered concrete the abstract as such, and has naturalized the artificial, replacing the territorial codes and the despotic overcoding, an axiomatic of decoded flows, and a regulation of these flows. It affects the second great movement of deterritorialization, but this time because it doesn't allow any part of the codes and overcodes to subsist. However, what it doesn't allow to subsist, it rediscovers through its own original means. It re-territorializes where it has lost the territorialities. It creates new archaisms where it has destroyed the old ones. The two become as one. The historian says, no, the modern state, its bureaucracy and its technocracy do not resemble the ancient despotic state. Well, of course not, since it is a matter in the case, one case of re-territorializing decoded flows, but in the other case of overcoding the territorial flow. The paradox is that capitalism makes use of the Erstat for affecting its re-territorializations. But the imperturbable modern axiomatic from the depths of, the, of its eminence reproduces the transcendence of the Erstat as its internalized limit, or one of the poles between which it is determined to oscillate. And in its imperturbable and cynical existence, it is prey to forces that form the other pole of the axiomatic. Its accidents, its breakdowns, its chances of being blown to pieces, of causing what it decodes to pass beyond the wall of its imminent regulations, beyond its transcendental resurrection. Any questions on that paragraph? It seems like a restatement of the last few, again talking about, as Alyosha says, fascism is always a sort of Damocles over democracy's head. It's always waiting there. Um, I think one comment that I have is that uh, at the very end there, that the... Uh the forces forming the schizophrenic pole involve these chances of being blown to pieces. This is the uh, the potentials and the virtuality that we were talking about before. So we're seeing how, uh, I don't know what to call the whole bipolar assemblage, but uh, how that has one end sort of in the virtual. Any other questions? Empty set? Mr. Skelton, Tiernan, 61? It sounds like you're naming off your. I number. am. I am naming off. Uh, how about how about how about uh, our uh, our YouTube viewers? We have three. Everyone cheer for our three viewers. Do they have questions? Hey, that's that's okay. Right. Let me get through the last paragraph, and we'll talk about. Uh, I'm wanting to do something different with our review session this week, um, and so I think uh, we'll talk through that. I think it'll be worthwhile. But for now. Um, let me go ahead and, I guess, finish off, and then we'll have a larger discussion, because we're actually about to end this section. Each type of social machine produces a particular kind of representation whose elements are organized at the surface of the socius. The system of connotation connection in the savage territorial machine, corresponding to the coding of the flows, system of subordination disjunction in the barbarian despotic machine, corresponding to overcoding, the system of coordination conjunction in the civilized capitalist machine corresponding to the decoding of flows. Deterritorialization, the axiomatic and reterritorialization, are the three surface elements of the representation of desire in the modern socius. So we come back to the question. In each case, what is the relationship between social production and desiring production? Once it is said, that they have identical natures and differing regimes. Could it be that the identity in nature is at its highest point in the order of modern capitalist representation, because this identity is universally realized in the eminence of this order and in the fluxion of the decoded flows? But also that the difference in regime is greatest in the capitalist order of representation, and that this representation subjects desire to an operation of social repression, psychic repression, that is stronger than any other, because, by means of the eminence and the decoding, anti-production has spread throughout all of production. Instead of remaining localized in the system, 
has freed a fantastic death instinct that now permeates and crushes desire. And what is this death that always rises from within, but what, but that must arrive from without? And in that, in that, in the case of capitalism, rises with all the more power as one still fails to see exactly what this outside is that will cause it to arrive. In short, the general theory of society is a generalized theory of flows. It is in terms of the latter that one must consider the relationship of social production to desiring production, the variations of this relationship in each case, and the limits of this relationship in a capitalist system. Not even gonna fucking try. There's this, this paragraph is, I think, an attempt to literally sum up the largest fucking section they have in this book. So I'm not even going to attempt, and I'm going to say that we are going to have to figure out how to really break this down and understand it. Because this is, if there is a sort of Cliff's Notes version of the everything else we've read in the last three days, it's this. I mean, to me, it goes back through basically this whole chapter. Yeah, it's the whole fucking chapter. God. And then the next, the next section is called Oedipus at last, and it's like, yeah, that's what I was hoping. So. <laughs> Uh, rather than take questions on this, I would love to, first, I'm going to, uh, close out the recording just because I have to. And so thank everyone for joining us. You don't have to leave quite yet. Please stick around. We're going to have a discussion about how I want to do a review, uh, and how I'm going to set this up because it's a very different thing for this large, large section. So, uh, thank you guys very much. There we go. That's where I'm going to end the edit. Uh, but for the review session, I don't want to just do one tomorrow where we kind of ramble through this. This is a very large section, and there is so much that it's referencing in the rest of the chapter that I think there are many questions I'm going to have, and I think a lot of people are going to have that's going to come over the next day. For example, Tiernan's, what is the Erstadt's rule? How are they talking about it? It was a fair fucking question. Uh, uh, but rather than us responding immediately to it, and I think we can actually, we can take a few moments and do some of these. Um, what I want to do is actually collect the questions in follow-up questions, which is in our text up here, and actually have people, and it can be literally anyone, just comment and say, I'll take that one. And please go away, research it, study it, figure out if you can find other writings on it, other elements inside of difference and repetition, logic of sense, where I'm going to be spending most of my time, uh, or in Masumi and Lazzarato and any of these guys who've uh, gone on to write. Uh, the goal would be that we then regroup Friday. We have the entire week and we actually spend time having a real discourse around what these things mean, what their intentions are, and how to actually break this down in a way that is knowable and understandable to all of us who are here. Because the combination of all of this as we move into the next few sections, I think is going to be necessary as a foundation. Please give me any thoughts on this. I agree. So generally, I, I think this is a good plan. I, I, I was wondering for a moment whether it may be more useful to actually do the last section of Chapter 3 as well before we do that. But um, I actually think that the last section, just giving over it, um, groups better with Chapter 4 than Chapter 3. It, it's, I, think, I think Section 11 is a lead-in rather than a lead-out. Um, so I think I think this is like the lead out of all of the points essentially for this entire chapter summed up here and they're about to basically do a setup. Um, well, so so Al Dreams for that, the goal would be that we set up a series of smaller mini talks. So if you want to take on one or two of these. Uh, and we have a discussion, set it up, grab a few people, jump into the room, call in Craig Bot, and then send me the link, record the discussion you have. And what I'm going to do is rather than just do a flat straight through recording like this and just edit it down and get it online, I'm actually going to edit together all of the side conversations as well. So that way we can have people like you, I'll dreams and OK, I'll take on this or I have a question or I want to have a discussion. We can do those whenever they happen to take place during the week. And Friday is essentially going to be a culmination of that. That's that's kind of my goal for the entire thing. 
So it's just my thoughts. Uh, but let's take a second and actually talk about the Urstadt. Uh, the, the concept of the Urstadt is that the state apparatus, well, we believe we've had many of them and that states have risen and fallen ever since the Roman times. Uh, they actually go all the way back to the first state and they say ever since the creation of that, uh, actually in Iraq, um, that uh, that first state has just never stopped. It's, it's morphed and it's changed some aspects of itself, but ultimately... Uh, it is an expression of itself everywhere. All these things are. And it's this this natural capture, this natural thing that exists. I think Roger puts it best. The Aristotle is the basis of the apparatus of capture that creates its own conditions as a general theory of social flux. That is uh, really well put, actually. Did you copy that from somewhere? No, sir. Really well done. But the short idea is uh, take any of the questions, take any of the things, take a concept and build it out, do a small recording. Uh, Kent did a phenomenal one that I'm going to be editing into this. Uh, he's done a couple of them and posted them into the into the readings. And it's uh, just really great. These little bits of discourse and conversation that are explanations, because what we're seeing in the people who are listening to the podcast and the people who are taking part is it's uh, a lot of people who are uh, first in all of this, uh, but I would say that the bigger sort of thing is it's people who are wanting to understand Deleuze and Guattari far more. And anything we can do to help drive that understanding and where they sit, because they sit in a place very opposing, I would say, most leftist thought, it's pretty important to and share as much as we can around that. All right, so Tiernan asks, uh, the paradox is that capitalism makes use of the Erstat for affecting its re-territorializations. What does this sentence precisely mean? Roger? Doug? Alyosha? Want to take that? Um, the paradox is that capitalism makes use of the Erstat for effect. Okay, so like there's different... Uh... <laughs> There's different function to the state. For example, the police, uh, the police function, and uh, the, all the regalian functions. Um, and basically, capitalism is actually reproducing itself through um, all the the the, the virtual um, functions that are contained in the state. So basically, it it, it taps into uh, the state machine to actually be able to uh, to live and reproduce. Yeah, I mean, I think it's getting at the, the sleight of hand of deterritorialization and re-territorialization. It's like, oh, it's not about, uh, you know, you you poor people might really value having clean water, but, like, we can't exchange that, so it's not really valuable. Like, that's the deterritorialization, but, like, the re-territorialization is shaped, tying it all back to, uh, you know, the the this is for the good of the economy, for the nation, or for whatever other larger entity. Um, to try another uh, side of that, um, the, the the Urstad exists purely uh, within the sort of barbarian despotic machine. The barbarian despotic machine is about overcoding, not the territorialization. So the paradox is that capitalism uh, and capital utilizes the Urstad. It basically utilizes aspects of the uh, barbarian despotic machine uh, to re-territorialize. And so by using the Urstadt for that, there's a, a, a interesting thing where we're basically decoding and deterritorializing flows, but then using the very thing that used to be about overcoding to recode. Uh, and so that, that paradox sort of sits. The systems n need each other. Alyosha's typing. <laughs> I'm looking for that chart. You know, someone, I had it recently. That was the, somebody had linked, it's like a PDF where somebody had basically made a whole chart with like production, anti-production, or stat, like all these things where you could kind of see which phase it corresponds to. And so it was actually really good. I can't seem to find it now. It was great. And I had it. And I don't know where it's at right now. 
I know the one the you're talking about. Should be in the, well, if it's the thing I think it is, that should be in the Zotero library um, and is called Social Ontology of anti Oedipus or something like that. I just keep clicking. I now, posted, now. I posted something in chat. Is it what you look for? Yeah, I think so. I think there's actually two. Because this this is one of them, and then there's another one. The other one I remember, like I have another chart from Anarchist Without Content that is just the three synthesis. Yeah, I think it's I think that one as well. Yeah, these like these that. were them. Okay, the uh, Zotero library they are both in the resource folder directly. Oh my God, this is amazing! This is, you've put a lot of effort into archiving this stuff. <laughs> I'm following the principle, if I don't read the stuff I collect, I might as well um, manage it. <laughs> you're, you're doing the Borges thing. That's what I was saying. You're making the map of the territory that ends up being the same size as the territory. <laughs> Make sure you stay schizophrenic and not paranoid with all that material. <laughs> and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, actually end that shit. Because it is... Basically, one of the most important. It's it's an amazing resource. Do you mind if I link to it in our descriptions and everything for the podcast and all that? Yeah, we should really. I mean, I didn't do, I didn't make those. Those are from the Anarchist Without Content um, blog. Which is I mean, a great I, I don't know if we, we can vet them, but I mean, to me, they look really good even if there's if, if there's disagreements it's a great starting point yeah it's a phenomenal just grouping of everything really oh and i think this um this diagram at the bottom of the uh, typology with despotism capitalism permanent revolution and savagery is um from um Holland. Like, I think that's in the intro book. I, I think there's a version of that, but I don't know where that one specifically is from. They, these are great, though. It's uh, I'll, I'll link to them. I'll have them in the... I'll, I'll, let me send the link out, actually. Copy link. Send it to our YouTubers. That way they can see what we're talking about and not have to Type out the nightmare links. There's like a lot of great material on uh, John Protevi's website, which I just linked. I was also recommending there's um, these essays. I think Lou also was the one who helped uh, get all these that are focusing on the use of Marx and capital uh, in this chapter and just in, in anti Oedipus in general, mm -hmm. that I think could be helpful sort of supplemental material for us. Is there a wonder? Right, I got a go. great uh, discussion, y'all. No, wonderful discussion. Thank all of you again for joining. I'm actually am going to start closing us out now um, so I can end the stream and end the conversation and uh, get back to re But uh, thank you guys. Uh, I'm going to put up some notes about how we're going to do this uh, reading and review of this. Uh, in short, please answer whatever questions you want. Take any that you have. Uh, we need it recorded in audio. So if you want to just record at home, if you want to jump into a chat right now, you can at Craigbot and you can invite Craig to any conversation. He will automatically record and send you a link. That link just send to me. Easy enough. Simple, simple, simple. Um, but that's the goal is to actually have conversation. So I may be pinging random people. And if you see me inside of a chat alone, don't hesitate to drop in. Uh, that's the intention is for randomly for us to have conversations. So I'm going to try this. We're going to see if it works a little bit better than just doing a sort of unstructured reading. See what happens. It may, it may turn out to be the, the fucking worst idea I've ever had. So there we go.
Thank you.